My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin, and my subject is trade beyond the Roman frontiers and the Roman economy. I have published several books on this subject. I am a council member of the Classical Association of Northern Ireland. The question is, what does the discovery of a lost manuscript by Galen reveal about ancient Rome? In 2005, a student from the Sorbonne in Paris was looking at old manuscripts in the Vlatadon Monastery in Thessalonica when he made an extraordinary discovery. Among a collection of medieval texts, he found a copy of a letter written by the ancient Greek physician Galen. The letter, titled On the Avoidance of Grief, was thought to have been destroyed during the Middle Ages, and it provides remarkable new insights into the global trade of the Roman Empire at the height of its power. The letter also reveals how ordinary people dealt with crisis and despair, for the events it refers to foreshadowed an era of unparalleled political and economic decline in the ancient world. And this previously lost account tells the story of a great disaster that befell the city of Rome in the late 2nd century AD. Claudius Galanus has been revered for centuries as the most important ancient authority on anatomical theory and medical practice. He was a renowned collector of written medical remedies, inventor of specialist surgical methods, and the originator of many therapeutic procedures. It was known that Galen had written a letter to a friend in his home city of Pergamum in Asia Minor about the nature of grief, but only fragments of the document had survived in Hebrew and Arabic manuscripts. The rediscovered document carries the full text in which Galen offers advice on coping with misfortune by recalling the greatest loss he ever experienced in his professional career, when a vast fire devastated the city of Rome in the spring of AD 192. Historians have long been fascinated by the first great fire of Rome, which occurred in AD 64 during the reign of the Emperor Nero. In the aftermath of this disaster, there was popular resentment of the emperor and even rumours that he had been complicit in starting or spreading the blaze. But until now, little attention had been given to the inferno that swept through Rome in AD 192 during the reign of another notorious Roman ruler, the Emperor Commodus. Galen was personal physician to Commodus, who became emperor in AD 180, following the death of his father, the Stoic Marcus Aurelius, regarded by many as the last of the five good emperors. Commodus proved to be very different from his philosopher father, and a rumour circulated that he was probably the son of a gladiator with whom his mother was said to have had an affair. Certainly, Commodus's remarkable exploits in the Roman arena, dressed as Hercules, did nothing to dispel the gossip or quell the concerns of conservative public opinion. Rome during the time of Commodus was a wealthy city full of bustling commercial activity. After the first great fire, Nero began to build a vast pleasure palace with luxurious private grounds in the space cleared by the conflagration. Plans for this monumental golden house were abandoned when the Roman commander Vespasian became emperor in AD 69. Vespasian gave orders that grounds leading up to the west side of the Palatine Hill were to be restored to the city and enhanced with monumental public buildings. The most famous of these was the Colosseum, known in ancient times as the Flavian Amphitheatre. This giant stone arena could accommodate up to 50,000 spectators. At the upper end of the Sacred Way, at the edge of the main Roman Forum, Vespasian also constructed an impressive new civic complex that became known as the Temple of Peace. This temple commemorated the end of the Jewish War, when Vespasian and his son Titus had crushed a major revolt in Judea. The edifice had further symbolism, for Vespasian became emperor 
as a victor of a vicious civil war. By these means he had ended a period of brief but serious political turmoil known as the Year of the Four Emperors. The Temple of Peace was set on high ground above the Colosseum and resembled a vast enclosed piazza with a central garden area filled with pools and statues. The sacred precinct had the features of a public park and surrounding buildings contained an extensive library. One of the main chambers in the complex displayed the Jewish menorah, the seven-branched candlestick, taken as a war trophy when the Temple of Jerusalem fell to Roman forces. Josephus reports, The Temple of Peace surpassed all human imagination, for Vespasian had vast wealth at his disposal, and he embellished this place with old masterpieces of painting and sculpture. Into one sacred precinct he gathered all the individual artworks that people had been willing to travel across the known world to see. He also placed therein gold artefacts taken from the Temple of the Jews. The Temple of Peace therefore symbolised the power and stability of the restored Roman state. It also held an important position near the sacred centre of ancient Rome on the site of shrines that had been preserved since the earliest periods of Roman history. Close by was the Temple of Vesta, just below the ancient Palatine Hill where Romulus was said to have founded the city. This small circular temple was dedicated to the Roman goddess of hearth and home. Here a sacred fire was tended by six vestal virgins, chosen from the wealthiest and most important families in the city. The flame symbolised the spirit and fortunes of Rome, and it was seen as a portent of an imminent disaster for the Roman state if the flames were ever extinguished. The Temple of Vesta also housed the Palladium, a sacred wooden image of Athena supposedly rescued from the devastation of Troy by Aeneas. It was believed that the continued success of Rome depended upon the safe preservation of this ancient artefact. Vespasian's son Domitian oversaw the completion of further monumental buildings along the Sacred Way, which led from the Temple of Peace down to the Colosseum. A large imperial warehouse, called the Horea Peperataria, was constructed next to this busy thoroughfare. The complex was so large that its side elevation on the Sacred Way was only slightly smaller than the façade of modern Buckingham Palace. Although it was called the Spice Warehouse, the facility stocked all manner of incense from Arabia and Somalia, along with spices from India and the Far East. This store of valuable international commodities proclaimed the extent of Roman power. Every year, Roman ships set sail from Red Sea ports in Egypt on voyages into the Indian Ocean. They visited trade centres in Somalia, Arabia and India, returning with thousands of tonnes of eastern cargo to supply Roman markets. Writing about the early stages of this international commerce, the Greek geographer Strabo reveals that 120 Roman ships sailed to India every year. The Roman government imposed a quarter-value import tax on eastern merchandise entering the empire. But instead of cash payments, merchants could surrender a quarter of their goods to customs officials in Egypt. As many merchants had most of their capital invested in their unsold cargo, they therefore took this option. The Roman government thereby came to possess great quantities of eastern commodities. A legal document from this era confirms the revenues raised by this trade. The second century Musurus Papyrus records that a single Indian cargo carried aboard the Roman merchant ship Hermopollon was valued at almost nine million sesterces. The Hermopollon was only one of many ships, and the tax in kind accumulated from this income of spices and incense explains how Nero was able to burn such a large quantity of Arabian fragrances at his wife's funeral. 
Pliny the Elder reports. Those who are most knowledgeable in this matter assert that Arabia does not produce in a whole year the quantity of incense that was burnt by the Emperor Nero at the funeral observances of his consort Poppea. The Horea Piperataria served as a vast commercial centre where the state sold rare eastern products to the population of Rome at carefully managed prices. Indian and Arabian products were crucial ingredients in Roman remedies, and many doctors bought their medical supplies from this place, because the quantity and quality of stock was assured. The regular presence of these physicians at the warehouses encouraged medical supply retailers to set up businesses in the vicinity. For example, Galen, in his Method of Healing, describes how a shop near the Sacred Way sold a special type of thin cord that was imported from Gaul and used for ligatures. The interior of the Horea Piperataria was divided into a maze of storerooms and high enclosed courtyards. There were numerous water troughs throughout the complex to dampen the oppressive atmosphere created by the dry and heavy aroma of the spice stocks. Comparing the dimensions of the building with other large warehouses, the complex probably held over 5,000 tons of spice when fully stocked. Such a quantity of spice, even if it were composed of simple black pepper, could fetch a market price of over 200 million sesterces. This is a figure close to a quarter of the entire Roman state income. Information about the people who worked in the Horea Peperataria is revealed by a 2nd century funeral inscription commissioned by a man named Publius Veracius Firmus to honour his two brothers, Proculus and Marcellus, who were employed in the complex. The brothers are referred to as Peperare, which could be translated as pepper workers. Special private storerooms were available to rent in the outer edifice of the Horea Peperataria. An inscription from an imperial warehouse commissioned by Emperor Nerva reveals how these arrangements worked in practice. Rent was paid in advance, and items kept in the storage units would be seized if the rental fees were not forthcoming. Rent at the spice warehouses were high, but goods stored there for safekeeping were considered to be extremely secure. A military guard was employed at the facility to prevent theft or damage to the stored items. It was also believed that there was very little risk of fire breaking out at the complex, because the building was constructed mostly of stone and fitted with numerous cooling water cisterns. For these reasons, professionals with an interest in eastern medical ingredients, religious incense or perfume manufacture chose it as a safe storeroom for their most important business stocks. By AD 192, the Horea Piperataria had stood secure for almost a century. So Galen rented one of the units to store the valuable eastern materials he required for his medical practice. In On the Avoidance of Grief, he explains the situation. People deposited their most precious treasures in the storerooms because they trusted that the warehouses along the sacred way would never be affected by fire. People were confident because there was no wood in these buildings other than the doors, and these warehouses were not close to any substantial private homes. What is more, the facilities were watched over by a military guard. It seemed that nothing could damage or destroy items placed for security in the Horea Peperataria. But Galen and his contemporaries were proved wrong about the safety of the spice complex. This is the end of part one of this talk. Please see part two, Galen and the Great Fire of Rome. For further information, follow the link to my books. The Roman Empire and the Indian Ocean, 2014. And The Roman Empire and the Silk Roots, 2016. Thank you.